Hi, welcome once again to St. Luke's U, where you become a disciple. I'm Dr. Jonathan Gross, and I am, for the last time, going to be talking with all of you about the Gospel according to John. You might notice that uh, my head is like this now, don't have any hair on the top of it. Uh, that's a decision that I've been considering for at least a couple years now. Um, back when COVID first hit and, you know, I wasn't going to be seeing anyone in person, I thought, you know, just go ahead and bake the, bake the hair, see how it would look. I uh, didn't have anyone that I was going to go visit who would judge me for it or whatever. And I realized, you know, actually this doesn't really look that bad. So my plan always was once I finished the PhD that I would just go ahead and embrace male pattern baldness and just, you know, go for the shaved head look. And so far I think it's going pretty well. Um, so, you know, this shaved head situation, it is an example of me kind of embracing uh, head on a certain bit of my human frailty. Is that an example of power being made perfect in weakness? I'm going to say that's, you know, kind of a lousy example, but maybe it's an okay example. And that is going to be my terrible segue into what we're going to be talking about with this lecture, this last discussion of the gospel according to John, which focuses on the death of Jesus in John's gospel. And so the title of this lecture is Cruciform exaltation. I think that's kind of a cool title. And it is, I think, a very good two-word description of how the author of the Gospel of John understands the death of Jesus. For him, the death of Jesus is not an example of humiliation. It's an, actually an example of glorification. Um, so one of the things that is worth pointing out from the outset about John's Gospel is that it is a passion-centric gospel. And in case you didn't know this, you probably know this from the title of the movie, The Passion of the Christ, if you don't know it from anywhere else, is that passion means suffering. And so the passion of Jesus is not just what Jesus is really amped or excited about. It is actually the suffering and the death of Jesus. So the Greek word pascho and Latin pati, uh, both of those pass into English uh, to create the word passion, um, which means suffering, at least in an antiquated sense that refers back to the Greek and Latin origin terms. We usually think of passion as sort of enthusiasm or excitement. That is kind of the everyday English meaning of the word, but an older meaning of the word passion ties back into these Greek and Latin roots, which refer to suffering. And so the Gospel of John really is focused quite tightly on the death and the suffering of Jesus. So you may remember this from the first lecture, but the structure of the Gospel of John can be very easily broken down into two halves. The first half going from chapter 1 through about chapter 11. Chapter 12 is kind of a hinge. You could put chapter 12 either in the first half or the second half, depending on how you break it down. Um, in chapter 1 through 11, we have what many people refer to as the book of signs. And so this is a lot of Jesus's miracles and his teaching about miracles. Um, and then chapters 12 through 21 are focused on the death of Jesus. This is called the book of glory. And it's called the book of glory often because the gospel of John repeatedly refers to the death of Jesus using terms of the glorification word group. And so here's kind of a breakdown chapter by chapter of the structure of the gospel according to John. The first half could be nicely encapsulated with the first half of John 1, 5, which is the light shines in the darkness. So we have all these examples of Jesus's light kind of shining. And then in chapters 12 through 21, it's really focused on Jesus's final week. And if you actually look at chapter 12, we're getting with Palm Sunday in chapter 12. Chapters 13 through 17 are focused on Maundy Thursday. That's the night before Jesus's crucifixion. Chapters 18 and 19 are focused on the death of Jesus. And chapter 20 is Resurrection Sunday. 
chapter 21 is a little bit after the resurrection of Jesus. And so most of the Gospel of John is concentrated, well, maybe not most of the Gospel of John, but a really huge chunk of the Gospel of John is concentrated on the death of Jesus. And so I think even though this saying was coined in response to the Gospel of Mark, it really works very well for John, uh, that the Gospel of John is a passion narrative with an extended introduction. So all of that, the Gospel of John is really important. It's a really or sorry, the death of Jesus is really important. It's a really big deal in the gospel, according to John. But the way in which the death of Jesus matters is probably going to upset our expectations a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to lay out, before we get into anything else, the things I'm going to show you about how the gospel, according to John, represents the death of Jesus. First, and this is the part that is really going to mess with your head a little bit, but it's, I think, pretty faithful to what is in the Gospel of John. The fourth gospel only minimally depict, depicts the death of Jesus as an instance of suffering or means of atonement. And suffering and atonement, those are really big things with the death of Jesus in a traditional Christian understanding of it. For the Gospel of John, that's actually a background feature. And you have some people who argue that there really is no suffering. There is no atonement whatsoever in the Gospel of John. I don't know that I could go that far, but John has a very different perspective on the death of Jesus. Uh, the way he does understand the death of Jesus is that it is something to be seen. It is something to behold. So we have uh, about half a dozen instances in the Gospel of John of the verb hupsao, which means to lift up and to raise up. And every single time that verb lift up, appears in the Gospel of John, it refers to the lifting up of Jesus on the cross. And especially when we first see that verb appear in John chapter 3, uh, where it, it talks about the representation of Jesus as, or the death of Jesus as uh, a saving event where you know, people look at Jesus when he's lifted up and that saves them. One of the things that's really at the forefront of, God, of John's understanding of the death of Jesus is that it is a means of glorifying Jesus and revealing something to believers. So it's about glorification and revelation. It's something to be seen. It's something to be beheld. That's a really important part of the death of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And then also, and this is the thing that is going to get to that theme that we've had kind of running through all of these lectures about how the Gospel of John does, in some very unexpected ways, equip us to meet Jesus in a divided world. The Gospel according to John presents the death of Jesus as a community unifying example. And so one of the things that we're going to see is that the death of Jesus is an example for forming the community, and the death of Jesus is itself a means of community formation. And so these things are a little bit different than what we're maybe used to hearing about the death of Jesus in the New Testament, but I think this is pretty faithful to the representation of the death of Jesus that we have as the author of the fourth gospel sees it. And so what I'm gonna, I'm gonna be working through a lot of verses. There's gonna be uh, quite a bit of ground to cover, but these conclusions that are on your screen right now, I think these are really gonna help you understand uh, where I'm going and kind of how all these disparate pieces fit together. So if we want someone who's going to pointedly represent this controversial point that we don't have much by way of suffering or atonement in the Gospel of John, the person to turn to for that hot take is going to be Ernst Kesemann. He is the same person who I mentioned last week uh, to kind of show this point of view that the Gospel of John didn't have a love your enemies command. Um, so this guy, he's uh, a all-star New Testament scholar who can be a bit of an iconoclast. So he presents this issue of the lack of suffering and atonement and the gospel according to John pretty pointedly at the beginning of his 
kind of a seminal book on Johannine interpretation. He says this, the problem of the divine glory of the Johannine Christ going about on earth is not yet solved, but rather strikingly posed. When we hear the declaration of the prologue, the word became flesh. And in what sense is he flesh? The Johannine Christ goes victoriously to the death of his own accord. And then in between, Kazamon mentions all these other things like walking on water and going through locked doors and, um, you know, all this kind of superhuman interaction going on with the Samaritan woman, all these things that Jesus does in the Gospel of John that are kind of superhuman. And then he points out that the cross in John is no longer the pillory, the tree of shame on which hangs the one who had become the companion of thieves. Uh, his death is the manifestation of divine self-giving love and his victorious return from the alien realm below to the father who had sent him. And I think Kazaman overstates this a little bit, but I think he is on the heartbeat of where the Gospel of John places the emphasis. So we do have references to Jesus as a Passover lamb. John 1, 29, John the Baptist declares, Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In John chapter 19, uh, the people crucified to the side of Jesus, they need to have their legs broken. Um, in order to expedite their death. The soldiers don't breathe, don't break Jesus' legs because Jesus had already breathed his last. And so Jesus then subtly qualifies as a perfect Passover lamb. And the Gospel of John also mentions that, you know, it was the day of preparation when Jesus died, and that would have been the time when the Passover lambs are getting slaughtered. So it's a little bit less explicit, but it's certainly there in John chapter 19 that Jesus is a Passover lamb and that Jesus does take away sin. So we have some mention of Jesus' atonement, but that's really kind of a background theme. It's not like these verses, whoops, these verses that we have in other places in the Gospels or other places in the whole New Testament, I should say, uh, where the atoning death of Jesus is kind of played up. So in Mark 10 and then Matthew 20, which you know is almost a verbatim representation of Mark 10, 45, uh, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Romans 3 um, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by God presenting Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood. In Revelation 5, Jesus is, uh, the lamb is worthy to take the scroll to open its seals because he was slain and purchased people for God by means of his blood. So these are more explicit statements of blood atonement in the New Testament. The Gospel of John is pretty subtle about that. And then when we actually turn to the depiction of the death of Jesus in the Gospel of John, the suffering kind of recedes. So in Mark 8, Jesus is telling his disciples the deal, and he says that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected and then be killed. And then in John 16, which it's, it's really interesting in Mark 8.32, it says Jesus spoke plainly about this. In John 16, also after these verses that I have on the screen, mentions, wow, Jesus is speaking plainly about things. He's revealing the real deal. So both of these kind of moments are places where Jesus clarifies what goes on, uh, explicitly by referring to his death. But in John 16, he kind of euphemizes it. He says, he's not going to say that he's going to suffer. He's not going to say that he's going to die. Jesus and John says, well, in a, lot, in a little while, you will see me no more. And then in verse 20, he says to the disciples, you will weep while the world rejoices. And so his focus really is on the grief and the suffering of the disciples. It's sad that the disciples aren't going to be seeing Jesus anymore. It's not that the son of man must suffer. Uh, and then these verses that I have on the screen here, these are kind of similar moments in Mark and John. In Mark, uh, Jesus is brought in before the high priest and, you know, he says, the son of man must come on the clouds in glory. And they say, well, this is blasphemy. And then in Mark, they spit at him, blindfold him, punch him, uh, mock him saying, oh, prophesy, LOL. Um, and so they have this, you know, really kind of ugly, humiliating scene. But then in John chapter 18, Jesus gets a slap in the face. So the suffering isn't fully deleted. But then that gets followed up by this mic drop moment where Jesus says, if I said something wrong, testify as to what it is that I did wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? So he's very innocent in this moment. And then he just gets taken away. There's no punching, blindfolding, spitting, any of that. It's a lot more dignified in the Gospel of John. And then um, in Mark 
15, you can see some of the stuff I've put in bold. They put a purple robe on Jesus. They twist together the crown of thorns. They fake call him king of the Jews. Uh, they pay fake homage to him by bowing and all of that and force Jesus. And then someone else has to force Jesus. To, it gets forced to carry Jesus' cross because Jesus is too weak to do that himself at this point. And then when Jesus is actually on the cross in Mark 15, 29 through 32, he gets mocked. And that's really encapsulated with this line, he saved others, but he can't save himself. And so they heap insults at him. So there's a lot of humiliation, um, a lot of mocking going on as Jesus approaches the cross in the Gospel of Mark. Gospel of John, well, we have Jesus carry his own cross. So... John wants to give us this different detail. John may have known of Simon of Cyrene, Simon of Cyrene carrying the cross of Jesus, but that's not the way the author of the fourth gospel wants to tell the story. It depicts rather how Jesus kind of uh, stoically handles all of this. And then we have this bit about Jesus is king of the Jews. And there's this moment where, you know, Pilate writes it down in three languages on a piece of, uh, you know, a piece of paper or something like that. And um, then has that fastened to the cross. And when people are like, no, 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 he's not king of the Jews. He just pretended to it. Pilate's like, what I've written, I have written. And so he refuses this opportunity to step back from calling Jesus king of the Jews. And so in a way, he somewhat intentionally affirms the kingship of Jesus. And then uh, the soldiers, they're not mocking him, but instead they're dividing or they're casting lots for Jesus's clothing uh, and they're intentionally not tearing Jesus's clothing into pieces. Uh, and so what's going on there is, is the author of the Gospel of John realizes like, hey, this is kind of playing into this thing from the Psalms about uh, where it says they divided my clothes among them, cast lots for my garment. So um, what's happening is instead of mocking Jesus, the soldiers are there actually fulfilling Psalm 22. So if the death of Jesus in the Gospel of John is not primarily about atonement, it's not primarily about suffering, then what is it? Well, one very consistent answer is that the death of Jesus is about glorification. So these are all places in the Gospel of John that use the verb doxadzin, which means to glorify in reference to the death of Jesus. So in John 7, uh, there's this thing that Jesus does that's uh, kind of puzzling, and no one understood what Jesus was really talking about until he was glorified, which in this instance is a shorthand for the death and resurrection of Jesus. Same thing going on in chapter 12, uh, where no one understood what it meant that Jesus kind of had his Palm Sunday approach on a donkey's colt until after the death and resurrection. It was after that when Jesus was glorified that they're like, oh, wait a minute, what Jesus did here on Palm Sunday actually corresponds to this passage in the Old Testament in Zechariah. Um, and then when we turn attention in the Gospel of John, this is chapter 12, kind of the hinge between the miracles and teachings of Jesus and then the death of Jesus, Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And then in 17.1, when Jesus has that prayer before his death on the cross, he says, glorify your sons so that your son may glorify you. And then in chapter 21, when it refers to the death of Peter, it says that Peter in his martyrdom would glorify God. So we have this connection between glory language and death language or, or the concept of dying. Um, and so this is chapter 12, and this is kind of the big hinge, the big transition between the first half of the gospel and the second. Jesus says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And then this is kind of where Jesus is sort of talking about the significance of his death. He says, very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And so Jesus is embracing his death. A voice from heaven declares, I've glorified it and will glorify it again. And so there's this declaration that the glory of God is about to come and about to accomplish all these wonderful things through the death of Jesus. And what's going on is we have in verses 30 through 32, 
we have this idea that the death of Jesus is primarily a revelatory event. Jesus said this voice was for your benefit, as in it's revealing something. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of the world will be driven out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, there's that hupsao verb talking about Jesus getting lifted up. Um, I will draw all people to myself. So it's the, it, the raising up of Jesus on the cross is this revelatory thing. It's this disclosing thing. And that is the method by which God is going to draw people to himself. So I think the death of Jesus in the Gospel of John, it's not primarily about atonement, it's not primarily about the suffering, but it's primarily about beholding the amazing thing that God is accomplishing in descending into human form and that humanity going all the way to the point of death. So the death of Jesus in the Gospel of John is not only, in fact, it's not really primarily about how much Jesus suffered on the cross or any notion of blood sacrifice or atonement. That just kind of takes a back seat in the Gospel of John. What's at the front of the Johannine understanding of the death of Jesus is that the death of Jesus is a moment of revealing disclosure. That is the moment where Jesus is lifted up for all to behold the love of God for humanity. And it is that moment of disclosure, that sort of epitomizing of the incarnation, that is the main thing that the Gospel of John wants us to see out of the death of Jesus. I don't think he's trying to say that there's no such thing as atonement, because the way that he kind of subtly presents Jesus as a Passover lamb, but for him, that's not the most important way to express Jesus' death. One of the other things about the death of Jesus that is pretty clear in the Gospel of John also is its impact on forming a community. The death of Jesus is something that creates a community, and it's also something that helps to unify a community. So there's this little vignette in John chapter 19. Uh, This is after Jesus has been nailed to the cross, but... It is before the actual final moment where Jesus drinks that vinegar sponge and says it is finished, breathes his last, uh, and then doesn't have any of his bones broken because he's a perfect Passover lamb. So it's in the middle of the crucifixion story. We have this moment where a family is created. So Jesus' mother, uh, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, uh, and Mary Magdalene. So there's all these women there, and then also the beloved disciple. Uh, And so this is the one, the disciple whom Jesus loved, uh, the person who informs the perspective of the gospel according to John, uh, may or may not have been the writer, may have been a writer of the stories that were incorporated in the gospel of John. In any case, there's the beloved disciple, uh, John the Apostle. And he is there beholding Jesus. And in this moment, Jesus says to his mother, woman, here is your son. And to the beloved disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, the disciple took her into his home. And so what's going on in this moment is a little family is being formed. A family is formed in the group of people who are together beholding the death of Jesus. And I think this moment of kind of establishing a mother-son relationship between the mother of Jesus and the the beloved disciple, this moment, I think, is kind of an interesting window into the effect of the death of Jesus on a community, namely that you have a group of people who are bound together in virtue of beholding the death of Jesus. And so what happens is uh, being a witness, testifying, seeing the glory of the death of Jesus, that is something that creates a community, that brings a community into existence. It's also something that shows what a community is supposed to look like. Uh, so you'll see uh, the oops, you'll see the text that I have on the screen right here, 15, 4, and 5. This is the part in the Gospel of John where uh, Jesus is kind of using this analogy of the vine and branches to talk about himself. So Jesus says, I am the vine. He says, the disciples are the branches. And so what he's setting up is this picture of discipleship where to be a follower of Jesus is to be uh, tightly interconnected to Jesus. And then right after that vine and branches imagery, he says, this is 1513. 
Uh, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. And that wording, when he says to lay down one's life for someone else, that wording is pretty much an exact match for in John chapter 10, when Jesus is talking about himself as the good shepherd. So Jesus says the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then John 15, Jesus says, the greatest love is for people who are within a community to lay down their lives for one another. And so what happens is the death of Jesus is presented here in the gospel of John as a template, as a model for participation in the life of the Christian community. And so all of that is kind of cemented with what we have in 15.9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. And so to be a Christian, to be a follower of Jesus, then is to replicate that kind of love, which manifests in that form of a, in the form of like a self-giving, self-sacrificing love. So Jesus's death is not just about atoning. It's not just about having something to behold, but it's actually a template for the behavior of the Christian community. And then we've got, another thing going on here. We have a Christian community is unified by death. So this is the end of John chapter 11, where we have a group of Jewish officials who are gathered together, uh, who are wondering, what are we going to do about Jesus? So if verses 47 and 48, to kind of state the problem, Jesus is running around. Uh, he's doing all these miracles. People are going to start a messianic uprising and the Romans are going to punish us. And, uh, by the way, the Gospel of John is written probably after the year 70. So it's probably written after the Jewish war that went from 66 to 70 AD, where the Romans actually did squash a uprising and ended up burning down the temple in Jerusalem. And so, you know, this whole concept of a messianic uprising, it's, it's understandable that um, the audience living after the year 70 um, would, would view that as a, as a serious threat. And so anyway, we have in verse 49 and 50, Caiaphas, the high priest says, it's really better for one, that one man die for the people than for the whole nation to perish. And what he's saying is that, hey, it's better if we just let Jesus die than open up the possibility of our entire nation getting punished for a messianic uprising. And the author of the Gospel of John notes as a commentary on this thing that Caiaphas, the high priest, said. He said that the Jewish high priest was prophesying in this moment that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation and not only for the Jewish nation, but also for the scattered children of God, bringing them together and making them one. And so we have this idea going on here in the Gospel of John that the death of Jesus is a unifier. It's something that is not just in the interest of the Jewish nation, but also all of the people who belong to God who are scattered throughout the world. All of those people are united and together beholding the glory of the death of Jesus. And this coincides really well with what Jesus prays right before going to his crucifixion. Uh, Jesus says, I pray for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And so what Jesus is doing in this prayer is he is asking for the relationship between the members of the Trinity, that tight unity between God the Father and God the Son, to be a template for the unity that exists, that constitutes the Christian community, and then represents the behavior of the Christian community. So he wants the he wants the church to be as tightly connected to God as God the Father and God the Son are, and he wants that tightness to exist within the Christian community. And it's saying that that is going to be the message by which, or that's going to be the means by which people understand the message about Jesus. So the death of Jesus is something that is supposed to tie a Christian community together. So what do we do with all of this? That the death of Jesus is a means of disclosure. It's something that shows us what God is like, and it's a template for the Christian community so that the Christian community as a whole can show what God is like. So what can it look like to take 
this lesson, this example of the death of Jesus into our life, particularly into our divided world. And so there's no end to the ways in which we could talk about this, but I'm going to provide something that could be a little bit of a roadmap, maybe an introduction to further discussion, if that's something you're interested in. And uh, one of the most kind of penetrating assessments of political life in America, or at least the relationship between American politics and uh, forms of everyday Christianity is from James Davison Hunter's To Change the World. And what he notices is that this pattern of resentment, which is, you know, it's basically this French word for resentment that uh, really Friedrich Nietzsche coined um, to talk about the sense of hostility towards others that assigns another group blame for one's frustration. So it's when you feel like you're backed into a corner and you blame everyone else for what's going wrong uh, with this kind of tinge of resentment. That's resentment. And uh, what James Davison Hunter notes is that American politics really in any form kind of revolves around various resentment narratives. And this is something that cuts across different political sectors or kind of distinguishes different uh, political sectors in, in the United States is just sort of which resentment narrative we choose. So right-wing Christians have a resentment narrative that looks something like this in James Davison Hunter's analysis. We were a Christian nation supporting family values, and then the leftists came in and ruined our sense of individual responsibility and religious freedom. That's the resentment narrative that right-wing Christianity kind of works with, that from which it understands the world. Then we have a left-wing Christian resentment narrative uh, we were this Jesus-loving, justice-serving community, but then the right-wing people had to corrupt all the Christians, and now Christian faith is about nothing except for right-wing causes, and people think Christian, Christian means Republican, and our whole faith is corrupted. That's the left-wing Christian resentment narrative. And then you can kind of have a third way that gets mad at both in, in different ways. So that could be like your Anabaptist, your centrist narrative. We were a faithfully non-political alternative community until the left and right came in and made us pawns in their, oops, I misspelled there, made us pawns in their political games. And so really no matter where you are politically, there is this super strong temptation to interpret all of this as a kind of resentment narrative. I think this tendency to opt for a resentment narrative in many ways is a natural byproduct of American individualism. We like to think, oh, if we could only just do these things ourselves, we would have everything perfect. But uh, then the bad people had to come in and ruin everything. And no matter where you are politically, you're going to be able to come up with some version of who the bad people are, what distinguishes the right, the left, and the centrist resentment narratives is just who the bad people happen to be. But these all follow this template of we were doing just fine and we had it all on our own until the bad people came in and kind of ruined things for us. So taking this pattern towards resentment, I think it's really easy to look at something like what's going on in John chapter 15 as sort of ammunition for our resentment narratives. So this is Jesus instructing the disciples. It's part of that two-level drama we, we heard about a couple weeks ago, where what Jesus is saying is addressed both to the disciples in the moment, in the year 30, and then also to the Christian community living circa 90 CE, for whom the final edition of the Gospel of John was written. Jesus says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. And so we have this, this passage that I think could be such profound ammunition for our resentment narratives because we can be like, oh, the world hates us. And we can decide, you know, uh, whoever we want it to be uh, is the world. So, you know, if we're right wing, we could be the leftists, they're the world. And then if we're left wing, we can look at the right wing and be like, oh, they are the world. And the world is coming up against us and ruining things for us. Um, and I wonder 
what if what Jesus is saying is not that you should get angry with and resent whoever these people are that you were tempted to think of as the world that is against you? What if the death of Jesus, precisely because it is accepted as and embraced as part of God's plan for revealing glory to the world, what if we were to embrace our suffering in that way? What if instead of holding resentment for those others whom we cast as the world, what if we were to follow the lead of the God who so loved the world that he gave his son? What if we were to follow the lead of a Jesus who so loved humanity that he entered into humanity and all of its frailty and brokenness and was very willingly laying down his power, even using his power to embrace defeat, to embrace death, to embrace crucifixion? What if we were to be like the man born blind, using our afflictions, using our negative circumstances as primarily opportunities for the glory of God so that God could be seen in the kind of community we have? What if we were to have a community so marked by mutual care and self-giving love that we were a picture of that incredible love that exists within the Godhead and between God and the world? What if we could be a picture of that to the rest of the world? I think that is what the death of Jesus can show us as we all live together, or at least try to live together in this divided world that we have.